There, you can see it. Yeah, I can see that. Point down the box. Okay, so it's just time. So let's start this next session. The first speaker is Horacio Cassini from Bariloche. He will tell us about generalized symmetries, algebras, and entropies. Please start. Okay, thank you. Thank you to you all for having me today. This is a, a talk about a recent work done with Marina Huerta, Javier Magan, and Diego Pontello. <coughs> this is a brief plan of the talk. I start by um, uh, describing a simple a unified perspective on generalized symmetries and completeness. Though this approach may be more abstract than the usual description, we think it simplifies the terminology in some, some sense and clarifies certain issues, and it may lead to generalizations. <clears throat> in particular, the approach starts from a question unrelated to symmetries, it's a question about the structure of the net of operator algebras attached to regions in quantum field theory. <clears throat> and the answer to this question uh, is that failure in simple properties, simple actions of the, of the net of algebras, additivity and duality, uh, lead to the fact that it can be multiple algebra from the same region, and this can be interpreted in terms of generalized symmetries. It also clarifies the fact that symmetries always come in dual pairs. In the second part of my talk, I will use this fact that uh, you have mo multiple algebra for the same region in order to describe uh, how to define entropic order parameters. These are entropic quantities that you can define and uh, measure the, um, the statistics of non-local operators or topological operators. This entropic order parameters satisfies a, a quite intriguing relation that we call the certainty relation that relates the statistics of dual entropic order parameters. And at the end, I will describe the expected behavior of these order parameters and some heuristics. So let me start describing operator algebras and causal regions. Um, let us take some, some set A of operators in Hilbert space we can define then the commutant that is a set of operators that commute with all operators in A. And there is a very nice theorem by von Neumann that tells that um, for a, a von Neumann algebra, that is general algebra in, in finite dimensional case and von Neumann algebra for, finite, for infinite dimensions, an algebra is, an, is a set of operators that is equal to the double commutant. And you have a further structure, the intersection of algebras are algebras, and you can also define the generated algebra of two, just taking the union and completing it by the double commutant. For regions in space-time, you can define very, very similar things. You can define, for example, you take a region, you take the causal complement that is just the set of points of space-time, which are spatially separated from W in this case, for example, this diamond, this W prime is the causal complement. And we define a causal region as a region which is equal to the W causal complement as this diamond shape is set here. And there is also the intersection of, of two causal regions is a causal region. And you can define also the generated causal region of two by taking the union and completing it. So there is a parallel, parallel thing here. And, and then in a quantum field theory, a quantum field theory has a preferred set of algebras described by, by the degrees of freedom associated to, to regions. <clears throat> and then one can ask what are the minimal relations that satisfy uh, algebras and regions in a quantum field theory. And these are the two minimal relations. One is that if you have a region that is included in another region, it must be the case that the algebras of operator attached to this region are also included. This is called isotony. And causality for a relativistic theory is just the fact that an operator attached to a region R has to commute with all operators that are attached to the complementary region R prime. So one can think what is what can be enhanced this this this, this axiom and um, in the maximal harmony between algebras and regions, the maximal possible relation that the case is given by these three axioms. 
So the first one is called hack duality and it's an enhancement of causality where you, you, you say that the algebra of a region is not just included in the commutant of the outside part, but is equal to that. It's a kind of completeness requirement. The second is additivity. It tells you that the algebra of the union of two regions is, is generated by the algebra of the two regions. And this is quite natural in quantum field theory because you generate the operators in a region by operators in a smaller regions uh, or field operators in, in, in very small volts. And the third is intersection property that is somehow the dual of additivity. And in fact, it can be obtained, it can be proved uh, if you assume how duality and additivity all the way. So I, I will not talk much about intersection property. We call a theory that satisfies all these things, all these things a complete theory. For example, the free scalar field is a complete theory in this sense. And it's also, it has been put as a tentative postulate in Hack's book 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, it doesn't hold for any theory, for, and we will see examples of that. So a complete theory is, a, is an assignation of algebra and regions that respect all operations, the inclusion, the union, intersection, and the complement. So one can think what happens to theories that are not complete, what can happen? And for that, we can define, given a region, for example, non topologically non-trivial region R, we can define an additive algebra to that, just as a union, the generated algebra of all the algebras of balls included in R. This, is, this defines a net that is the additive net, and it's the minimal possible assignation of algebras for R for a, for a given region, because it, it, this algebra must contain all the algebras of all included in R. So if this is the minimal one, the maximal one would correspond to the, com the commutant of the minimal one uh, or corresponding to the complementary region. So this is a maximal algebra compatible with causality uh, because it has to, the, this, this algebra has to commute with the additive operators in, in, in the complement. So the question is where these two algebras are equal or not. If they are not equal, it must be the case that the maximal algebra is equal to the additive algebra of the same region time plus or uh, generated with some other operators A. And the same for the commutant region, for the complementary region, the maximal algebra should be the additive algebra there plus some other operator. These A and B operators are dual non-local operators, non-local in the sense that are not locally generated by operators in the same region. And this is identified in, in the usual terminology as a topological operator. It's, a, it's an operator that and lives in the region R in the sense that it commutes with local operators outside, but it is still some non-locality. In this situation where A and B is non-empty sets, uh, you cannot choose the net to, to satisfy simultaneously additivity and duality. So as the maximal algebras are algebras, it means that these operators A um, uh, form classes, classes of operators which uh, close under, under, under products. So they, they must satisfy some kind of fusion rules and the same for operators B. And in general, these fusion rules uh, may, may be more complicated, but in some, in, some, in some particular cases, they are fusion rules of representations or conjugacy classes of groups. So they are related to groups. And this lead, uh, leads to the identification with generalized symmetries as described in this paper, for example. So it, it, it happens that the type of uh, allowed symmetry algebras or, or the fusion rules will depend on the topology of the regions and the dimension and very little is known about the, 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 this problem. So to summarize, uh, this, uh, this thing, uh, uh, our proposal is that completeness corresponds to additivity and duality of the net of algebras. And it is related to the, the, the non-existence of generalized symmetries. It is the same thing. 
In particular, generalized symmetries are then, is then, are then related to the fact that the, there is more than one possible physical algebra that can be attached to the same region. And another consequence is that generalized symmetries always appear in dual pairs. And this is a consequence of the von Neumann theorem of the double commutant theorem. And this, uh, this is completely independent of the type of symmetry, the dimension of space time or the topology of the region. So for example, magnetic electric completeness are the same thing. It cannot be, you, you cannot have magnetic completeness and not electric completeness. And the idea is very simple, is the fact that if you have the additive algebra is included in the maximal algebra of, of a region, so, and these are different, if you take the commutant, then the additive algebra of R prime has to be included and not be equal to the maximal algebra of R prime. Better, it's better that th these are not equal, otherwise taking the commutant again, it will imply that these two are equal. So if this is not, this is a, is a strict inclusion, this might be a strict inclusion. And for the same reason, the dual non-local operators can cannot commute to each other. So this A's and B's operator cannot commute all to each other. So an example is given by global symmetries. And in this case, the, the, um, the non-trivial uh, non-local operators appears in the case where the regions uh, have non-trivial homotopy groups pi zero or pi d minus two, the, the complementary regions. For example, you have two balls here, so they, have a, they are disconnected regions. In order to see that, you can form, uh, you can take an, a, a theory F with a global symmetry and take the, the quotient with a, the group symmetry. So you have the orbifold, that is just the operators that are neutral under symmetry. And then you can take, for example, a charge operator in, in the region R1 in, the, in one ball and the uh, anti-charge operator in the other ball. The product of these two will be a neutral operator. It will belong to the orbifold, but it cannot be decomposed additively in, as a product of operators in the two regions. So it's a non-local operator. These are called intertwiners and are labeled by representations of the group. Uh, and in the complementary region, the non-local operator is given by the twists that are uh, operators that implement the symmetry uh, group, but only in, in this ball, only in, in one of these balls. So uh, in, in, if you have a non-abelian symmetry, you can, you can form a, 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 a neutral operator just taking the sum of these twists over the conjugacy classes, so are uh, labeled by conjugacy classes of the group. So if you take, if you start, for example, for, from the additive algebra of the two balls without charge and charge operators and take the commutant, the commutant will contain the twist operator on top of the additive elements outside. And if you start from the outside part without, um, uh, with only local operators, you take the commutant, it will contain the intertwining. So we obtain this structure that I shown before. Another example is the case of regions with non-trivial pi one or pi d minus three. So uh, this, for example, in four dimensions, the topology of a torus, you have a non-local operator that looks like a loop inside and the complementary region will also have some kind of loop operator. In this case, for dimensions greater than three, one can show abstractly that uh, the, the, the possible fusion rules on non-local operator is always correspond to abelian groups, the abelian, uh, one abelian group and the, um, and, and the dual abelian group. And the commutation relations are fixed here. The commutation relation of this number is just the character of the representation B applied to the element A. A an example of this is given by gauge theories. One can think, well, the Wilson loops are non local operators, naturally line operators here. But is, it, as is well known, not on all Wilson loops are really non-local operators because if you have a charge of the same charge field operator of the same representation, you can form Wilson lines, and with these Wilson lines, you can break the Wilson loop as an additive operator in the region. And the same happens for non-abelian gauge fields because you always have these Wilson lines corresponding to the curvature tensor. 
So uh, the adjoint representation and all the gen representations generated by the adjoint are, are, uh, can be broken, are additive, add additive operators. And at the end, the only thing that you get as a non-local operator is a correspond to representations of the center of the group. The dual operators are the top loops. So then let me uh, start descri describing this uh, idea of entropic order parameters. With these entropic order parameters, we want to, uh, to produce a, an entropic quantity that measures the statistics of topological or, or non-local operators. We have seen that we have two algebras at least for the same region. Uh, and with that, we will produce two states for the same algebra. And with these two states for the same algebra, we can compute the relative entropy. So how is that given two algebras, we produce two states for the same algebra? Well, that is done by the introduction of a conditional expectation. The conditional expectation is just a map of, a, of an algebra to a subalgebra, in this case, the maximal algebra to the additive algebra. Um, it's a particular map that keeps the, the small algebra invariant. <clears throat> and the use here of this conditional expectation is just to lift uh, a state from the subalgebra, for example, the vacuum state in the subalgebra, just composing it with the conditional expectation, we form a state in the big algebra, in the maximal algebra. In quantum field theory, this conditional expectation that we are interested in are just produced by the non-local operators themselves. For example, here I have a charge and discharge operator and uh, averaging by the action of, uh, of the twist operator, I can kill um, the, the non-local operator and the result belongs to the small algebra, the additive algebra. And then, we can then define an entropic order parameter, just, which is just the relative entropy in the maximal algebra between, for example, the vacuum state and the vacuum state composed with the condition expectation. So the relative entropy is known to measure the distinguishability between two states. And the difference between these two states is precisely the expectation values of non-local operators. Here we have vacuum expectation values and for the other state, it's just zero, this expectation value, because the conditional expectation eliminates them. So it is a measure of the statistics of expectation values of non-local operators, but it doesn't depend on the particular non-local operator, because there are infinitely many that I can take that belong to the same class. It doesn't depend on that, but depend on the, on the geometry. So it somehow uh, measures the best one, the, the, the one of, of greater expectation value. It's, it's only a function of the geometry and the vacuum state. If one do not want to talk about entropic quantities, one can also see that uh, you can produce a standard non-local operators that are determined exclusively by the geometry and the vacuum itself. Um, so for example, one can think if you have a torus in four dimension, you can produce a standard Wilson loop operator attached to this torus. So in, the, in this situation, we have this complementarity di diagram. This is a maximal algebra of the region R, and there is a condition expectation that goes to the additive algebra. And in the complementary region, you have the maximal algebra and there is a a complementary or dual conditional expectation that goes from this to the additive algebra in R prime. And, you, and this, these conditional expectations are completely fixed and uniquely defined in the continuum quantum field theory. So you, you don't have to worry about how to define them. And then there is, uh, in the vertical direction, the relation is just simply that commutant algebra. So this, the, the commutant of this is this, and the commutant of this is this. In this situation, in this situation, we have uh, that for a pure global state, as the vacuum, for example, we have the entropic certainty relation. And th this is a relation between the entropic order parameter for the region R and the corresponding one for the region complementary, the R prime. The sum of these two relative entropies is equal to a number that is fixed. It doesn't depend on on the geometries of the region 
or the particular state that, that I'm, I'm taking. And this number is this is, this is a logarithm of, of an index of the inclusion of, of the algebra that was described by mathematicians. Um, in the particular cases of a, of a symmetry group that is, uh, is a group, there is just the logarithm of the size of the group. So this relates the statistics of dual order parameters. We, we, we describe it first in this paper in the case of global symmetries and Javier Magan and Diego Pontello then extended it to arbitrary uh, finite dimensional systems. And these two works describe this more in the, in the type three algebras um, uh, that uh, appear in quantum field theory. So what, what, why is this called entropic certainty relation? The reason is that it is very much related to uncertainty relation for operator. You have this relation, and as the entropy is always positive, the relative enters are positive quantity, it means that both of the order parameters are bounded above by log G in this case. But for four minutes for uh, your talk. Sorry? Four minutes. Okay. So, but they cannot be um, uh, saturated at the same time, right? Because uh, they, you have to satisfy this. And this is related to the fact that the operators A, non-local operators A and non-local operators B do not commute, commute to each other. This same relation gives a handle on computations because if you, if you know the expectation value of non-local operators A and B, you can reduce to uh, the, the entropies to these uh, algebras of non-local operators and produce upper and lower bounds to your uh, relative entropy or the parameter. So these are some uses that you, uh, you can think of. of this. For example, in this case, I take some, some arbitrary region here, A, and the compl almost complementary region B. And then for this case of global symmetries, you can see that the relative entropy or the parameter is just the difference of mutual informations in the theory with charges minus the one in the theory without charges. And in the massive case, and when the regions are very near to each other, it just uh, give you a, a purely topological number proportional to the number of boundaries. You can also use it as an order parameter for phases of gauge fields. For example, in the infrared for large loops with a small width, you, you have, a, for example, for the Higgs phase, the, uh, re the relative entropy of the Wilson loops go to a constant law and the tough loops go to an area law. And the opposite is uh, supposed to happen for confined theories. Confined theories. For the conformal case, you always get the perimeter law. So in this sense, in our case, we, we cannot renormalize as usually done the, the, the perimeter law to a constant in this case, but in this case, it, it, it happens. We cannot arbitrarily renormalize operators here because they, they, they have to satisfy an algebra. So this is just an heuristic on how um, this area versus constant law appear. In this, in this setup, suppose you have a, a ring, uh, origin, orange ring here, and you want to find how the, the relative entropy behaves. And in the outside part, you can, you can place many of these black rings crossing the, the inside. And then if, if your black, uh, black uh, non-local operators have a constant law and they are decoupled to each other, you can easily compute the relative entropy in the black algebra and it give you some number approaching saturation minus some uh, small deviation that grows with the number exponentially in the number of black rings you have there. And uh, as you can place an area worth of these black rings, it means that using the, the, uh, and the, the certainty relation that the relative entropy in the orange ring has to decay with an area law. So let me do some final remarks. One of the things that, uh, that our work um, uh, highlights is the importance of wide loops as opposed to line operators that are usually described in the literature. So, and, and the reason is that the 
first that the dual the the, the wide loops are dual to thin loops so they have related uh, order parameters and the second is that if you want to study the normalization group flow of these symmetries or understanding what happens with the with the symmetries and normalization group you want to study uh, regions under under scaling and this uh, changes the size of of, of of the region so so it's very is not well suited to use line operators in this sense because they are partially ultraviolet and partially infrared. These are like projects for the future, how to relate the ultraviolet and infrared. This is important for theories with asymptotically free theories and for proving confinement. We don't have a handle yet on how to, how to manage these, these things to understand better in, the, in terms of entropic terms. Uh, and another important thing is classific the classification of the possible fusion rules for different topologies of regions and different dimensions. Very little is known about that. Um, and of course, we want to compute all the parameters for non theories and for uh, holographic theories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very beautiful talk. It's time for question. So uh, I'd like to Miguel Montero. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice talk. So I have, um, uh, I have a question about the part where you argued that uh, the completeness of the spectrum is equivalent to, to absence of global symmetries. So absence of global symmetries, do you mean uh, useful global symmetries or non-invertible global symmetries? Uh, so would you also include those? And relatedly, um, I would also like to know to what extent these arguments will apply also to lower energy effective quantum field theories, which might be complete to quantum gravity as opposed to quantum field theory. Okay. Uh, let me start from the second one. So uh, is, what, what, what I said that the dual symmetries come uh, in, um, come always together, right? And then the question, I think that your question is whether this somehow um, survives the normalization group in the sense that you can have at the infrared, for example, some symmetry and the other one is only seen at the ultraviolet, something like that. Well, we don't think that that, that happened. The reason is that if you have the, the, uh, the certainty relation, for example, and you have this, uh, in the case, for example, you have charges that are very massive, this will go to zero, and then the other one is saturated. When the other one is saturated, it means that the non-local operators have expectation value one. It means that they act trivial in the Hilbert space and can be thought as, as constant, as a unit. So uh, both disappear, from our point of view, disappear at the same time or appear at the same time. But it's important to not, not to be confused exactly this point. This point here is that you cannot use line operators, otherwise, you will always have small expectation values and you can think, well, there is something there. But if you use, for example, in the infrared wide, wide enough loops, you will see that your loop operators are going to one or either to zero, for example, if the theory disappears, and then both of the, of the, the algebras disappear at the same time in that sense. And your first question, I, I think I'm, I'm less able to answer correctly what you say, in the sense that I think uh, what you say is that, um, well, I, let me repeat what I said here. Uh, let me repeat what I said here. Uh, let me say where is it? Um, that this fact that the symmetries come in dual pairs is completely independent of the type of symmetry dimension and topology. So it doesn't depend on what extra operators you have, this, this that you have called what you have called this uh, non-invertible or something like that. Yeah, uh, I just mean uh, I just mean topological operators. I just mean the yeah, topological operators that can have a non-trivial fusion algebra, uh, but they don't have a group law. Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So of course, in that case, one has to work out what are the um, what are the the dual let's say fusion algebras or something like that. But it cannot be the case that one is. Is, is there and the other is, is doesn't have any operators or doesn't have any. So, so I'm asking because there, there are examples where you can have a, um, um, an incomplete spectrum and, uh, and no ordinary 
global symmetries, but you can still have these other guys. Uh, so that's the example I was asking about. Yeah, well, I, I know that people discuss these things. I, I think they should, they, they, it, it would be nice to revise these things under, under this perspective because people usually say these problems that you mentioned, perhaps in topological theories or something like that. And these topological theories have to be thought uh, in, perhaps in a different uh, in a different setup because topological strictly strictly topological theories do not have operators attached to regions, right? We, I'm thinking here in, in theories that have uh, some operators attached to regions. So um, perhaps if you can put a, a little cutoff and say your operators uh, have some some typical mass or something like that, then you you regain all this all, all this that I'm saying here. Okay, so next Zoha. Thanks. Nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I had a small technical question about the slide where you spoke about regions with non-zero pi one. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, if you can just uh, quickly. Uh, yeah, it's the next slide, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so here you mentioned you mentioned that the operators uh, form an abelian group, but I don't understand why this is true. In general, the space of lines doesn't form an abelian group whatsoever. Well, in the space I'm, of topological, the space of topological lines doesn't form any sort of group. Okay, uh, I'm 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 saying this only for the case of a single like uh, like torus. If you are thinking in in regions with are not to each other or something like that, then it, it might be more complicated and we haven't worked it out. If, if you are thinking about that, if your question is about that. Even on a single torus, the, there could be a highly non-trivial R matrix. So I don't completely, uh, maybe I'm, we should discuss it later because- I No, 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 okay. But, but uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking only on the generalized symmetries, not on the full algebra of, of uh, this, because, for example, you can have a, maybe you are talking about Wilson loops can have a, like a, a fusion rules of, of, of uh, non abelian fields, but here it's always abelian because it's only the, it's only the part that is non, um, that is non local, that it cannot be destroyed in the sense of it's a product of Wilson lines, for example, mm. because of this. Okay, right? I understand. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So time is running out, but I, could you ask a very quick question? That's Nodo IAS. Hi, hello. Um, this is Xu Han. Uh, can you go back to the earlier slide on completeness and how to think about it as a generalization of modular invariance? Yeah. Ah, okay. This 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 commentary is because in in two dimension CFT, uh, for example, from this paper, you 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 can see that for two intervals, for two intervals, the entropy of the two intervals is equal to the entropy of the complementary two intervals in a circle, for example, if there is modular invariance. So modular invariance is naturally associated to this property of the entropies, and the entropies are equal for commutant algebras. It's important, it's not equal for uh, complementary regions. It's equal for, for commutant algebras, so it means that in that case you have a you 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 have a, a hack duality for for two intervals. So um, modular invariance is in this sense and also in more direct sense. Uh, in this paper by Feng Shu, for example, you can see that it's related to um, a hack duality for more than one interval. But I'm confused by the connection to no generalized symmetries that you wrote above. 2D modular invariant CFT can certainly have global symmetry, right? So what, what do you mean by no generalized symmetries of all? Well, I, I'm thinking that, that the symmetries are exactly, it's a stagionalization of the idea. The symmetries are given by this uh, uh, existence of non-local operators. For example, in two dimensions, you can have non-local operators for two intervals, right? Uh, and then, uh, this is this is what modular invariance is is uh, is uh, somehow uh, uh, prohibiting. So okay. it's a, okay in that sense. I, I'm taking 
all these cases I'm calling uh, generalized symmetries. All these cases I'm calling generalized symmetries. It can be many different things in different dimensions and uh, et cetera. But in the, in the cases that have been studied, for example, for, for this, uh, these torus things, it, it coincides with the usual generalized symmetries for gauge theories. So Daniel, only short, short question. Well, okay, I'll just say very fast. I think that this approach doesn't sufficiently distinguish between gauge and global symmetries. So just for example, let's talk about a free scalar field with the symmetry phi goes to minus phi. Is this a gauge symmetry or a global symmetry? I think that it's a different theory depending which of those decisions we choose. But I think that you're just describing those as two different algebras, two different choices of algebra in the same theory. So in fact, you had it in the, in the slides, right? Like you, you said you had a global symmetry, phi goes to phi minus phi, but then you wanted to restrict to neutral states and introduce twist operators. But yeah. I would have just said when you're doing that, yeah, you're yeah. gauging the symmetry. Well, there is, there is only one important difference in this case of global symmetries with respect to the others, the one can think is the fact that in the case of global symmetries, if you have this theory, the orbifold, you can always produce another theory which doesn't have algebra region problems and which uh, has the same expectation values for the, the operators, the neutral operators. This is called the, this is what's proved in the DHR analysis, it has many years. So you start from the orbifold and you reconstruct the theory without uh, changing the expectation values of the, of the neutral state. You know, but yeah, but so we would call that the inheritance property of gauging a, a discrete global symmetry. So I, I would say that that is the theory where you gauge the symmetry. It's a different theory. No, no, we say, well, you, from F you can obtain O and from O you can obtain F, right? Yeah, but if you go to another topology, it'll be very clear because you'll have loops. The question is what loops can you have on cycles that are not contractible? And then you're really gonna have to be pinned down on this. Yeah. I, okay, I don't well, understand what is the what is the, the point really. I, I, I think you it, it you should be care. I mean, I think you the formalism should clearly distinguish between a gauge and a global symmetry. Let me just maybe make it as a comment. No, I don't well, think it should be well, up to you this, how you all interpret this formalism, it. Formalism, uh, all this formalism is all for let's say generalized as people call it, generalized global symmetries. Generalized global symmetries. There is nothing. Yeah, but like, for global symmetries, we don't restrict to singlets. So when you're restricting to singlets, you're kind of gauging the symmetry. Yeah, but, uh, but I'm sorry, is, I promised to Dashi this, this would be fast. So I, I think sorry, we I, I suggest, uh, yeah. yeah, we should Move go on, on I think. Yeah. Okay, so let us thank Horatio again. Okay.